thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, last talk of the day. Uh, so you're almost done. Hope you had a great day. I did have a great day. Uh, I really love this conference. I've been talking a couple of times, never on communities. Uh, it's really a great conference. And obviously, they always keep the best talks for the, for the last spot, right? <laughs> so quick introduction. Um, I've been working a lot in uh, network security, uh, and then moved to application security at uh, Salesforce. And a year ago, I joined a startup uh, offering uh, security solution for, for Kubernetes, Octarine. And that's where I got introduced to Kubernetes, didn't really know much about it uh, earlier. And I've seen what people are doing for Kubernetes. And that's really what this talk is about, is what are the security practices that companies are doing or not, or not doing? And what are the challenges of doing security for uh, Kubernetes? So I'll do a very, very brief introduction to uh, Kubernetes. Uh, I'll talk about the promise of uh, Kubernetes, how it looks on paper uh, for security. Uh, do a real reality check of the security for Kubernetes, and then uh, spend more time on how people are dealing with uh, security, companies are dealing with uh, security. And really, it's, it's all based on real example of companies uh, I've worked with and what I've observed from, uh, from many people uh, using Kubernetes. So all you know, all you need to know about Kubernetes is the logo, how it's spelled, and how you abbreviate Kubernetes. Uh, so now you know you know everything. Uh, maybe just add it was started by, by Google. Now it's uh, an open source project under the CCNF. Uh, they are yearly conference about communities. But basically what it is at a very, very high level communities, and I'll go into, into a little bit more details later, but it's uh, an orchestration level layer that uh, orchestrates all your containerized application. Uh, it abstracts the underlying uh, hardware, so you don't have to worry about whether you're on-premise in the clouds, how many nodes you have, how to add uh, servers, and also it manages your um, containerized application, your containers directly. So it figures out where to distribute your containers, what's running, what's not, what needs to be restarted, uh, etc. And why was this talk at the at a security conference? Uh, it's probably not the only talk about Kubernetes here or in any security conference because the adoption of uh, Kubernetes is growing very fast. Uh, so this was a survey done uh, last year. Uh, no, about 90% of the companies are using uh, containerized application. Uh, about 90% of these uh, companies, so about 80% of all companies are using it in production. And really, Kubernetes have been taking over the world of uh, managing containerized application. Now, there used to be older technology like Swarm and others, but the adoption of uh, Kubernetes is, has been really phenomenal. Even in the year since I joined, pretty much every company is at some stage of adopting Kubernetes for a lot of their uh, applications. But uh, it's not just a new technology. It also has a big impact on how companies work. Now, what are the, the responsibilities of the different teams? What are the processes that they need to have to be able to um, take advantage of the agility of uh, Kubernetes? And this has a huge impact on, on security. But probably the saddest reason uh, I, want, I wanted to give this talk in a security conference is we sell a security product. So every time we go to a company, we used to say, so what are you, your requirements from your security team? You know, so we can show that we are addressing all of them. And they were telling me, well, they're just not involved in Kubernetes. So we don't have any requirement from the security team. Or they don't know Kubernetes, so the requirement they give us just make no sense for, uh, for Kubernetes. So hopefully, for those of you who are working in security teams, you'll have some pointers, at least, to uh, start looking into security and understanding why um, there are probably different requirements for, for Kubernetes and what changed. So if you uh, haven't looked at Kubernetes, by the way, how many of you are familiar with Kubernetes? Maybe work with it already? OK, so almost half of the room. And maybe the other half is just too shy to uh, raise their hands. Uh, so if you look at Kubernetes documentation and how it's being used in companies, a couple of takeaways that it will take for security. One is the developer is king, right? It's not just about developing the application now, but they also have control over the infrastructure. So with Kubernetes, the infrastructure is code. You have a YAML definition file that defines um, where you want to put 
load balancer or ingress controller, or how you manage your network security policy, uh, what, uh, what traffic is allowed, um, really all of your infra infrastructure, but also how you run your containers, what are the security settings for your container, what's the level of access. So it really goes beyond just the application and include the entire um, infrastructure. And if you look more specifically, specifically for security, you know, with Kubernetes come microservices. A lot of companies are actually taking the opportunity when they are moving to Kubernetes to um, leave their mono monolithic application and move to microservices. So now you're talking about looking at small units uh, that should be well defined, uh, that should do just a few things. So if you want to do a security, security view, it should be much easier, right? You're not looking at a huge uh, application, but rather at many small parts. Uh, that should be better defined. Because they are separated, you can also do more isolation and notably um, network segmentation. Uh, so you probably heard about zero trust network. The idea is now that you have all these services, you know exactly what service is supposed to talk to each other. So you can first start with only allowing service to service communication and blocking everything else. And then you can go even layer seven and only allow specific path, specific method. I mean, you can go very far into the kind of segmentation. Um, so all of that looks great, right? You have small parts that are now isolated. You uh, have a much smaller uh, attack surface. You don't have this you know, weird interaction about many parts of the product that shouldn't talk to each other, but somehow somehow do. Uh, the other thing that you will take away uh, is that um, you have integrity of containers over time. So the way you deploy a new application or you make changes to application, you don't go inside the container and make changes, but rather you uh, check in new code, a new application, a new container, and you basically replace the existing containers with a newer version. So if you look at your running cluster and all the workloads at any time, it should be the exact uh, replication of what you have in your source code. So you don't have to worry about the drift between what's being checked in and what is actually running in production. And that allows, you know, the third uh, great thing for security is that since everything is checked in, not just the code, but all the configuration, all, all the infrastructure, it makes it easy for you to replicate the production environment. So if you need to do uh, some kind of intrusive testing, you can, again, just take what's in the code repository, uh, build your own cluster, and you should have, you should have the exact same image uh, that you have in production. So there's no question about um, did they change the code of configuration there? You know, is it different here? Uh, you should have the same thing. So all of that looks great for security, right? A lot of advantages that we don't have today when we manually configure servers, when we manually deploy a big monolithic application. But unfortunately, all these characteristics are not necessarily a given. Uh, Kubernetes give a lot of flexibility to what developer can do. And pretty much any of the settings inside, uh, any of the container settings, for example, can be changed through uh, Kubernetes. So a lot of settings, for example, will break the isolation between containers. So you have some settings that allows you to share the PID namespace between containers, the IPC. So now processes in two different containers can talk to each other like they're running in the same container. So these two settings break uh, some of the isolation. Uh, they can also share the same host path. So they, they can share part of the file system on the host and you know, share file, they can kind of communicate together by you know, chain making changes to the, to, the, to the file system that's then read by another containers. We talked about uh, network segmentation, but same thing. It's not a given that the isolation on the networks exists. There are again, a couple of capabilities and settings that allows you to break that completely. So for example, you can allow containers to forge any kind of packets and do app spoofing and do man in the middle, basically redirect all the, the host traffic through them so they can see all the communication from different containers. Uh, so that's doing it like abusing maybe one of the privilege, but you can, there is a setting that doesn't require you to do anything malicious, uh, share host network, and basic, basically what it does, it, it gives the container access to the loopback interface. So it can just look at all the traffic from all the containers on the nodes and again see what's, uh, what's going on. It's also very easy to break the isolation of uh, containers from the outside. So the, the right way to expose the service outside of your cluster is to create a load balancer or an ingress controller and you know, apply corresponding network policy. 
but no, there is the equivalent of the SSH port redirect. You can just run the kubectl port forward. It basically forward your local port to a container, exposing your um, internal service, internal container to your computer. And obviously, if your computer is exposed to the internet on some malware, uh, you might expose it to, uh, to more than just your computer. So these are all small things that can break some type of isolation. But if that's not enough, um, in Kubernetes, you have the uh, role-based management uh, for workloads. So workloads can have a service account, uh, which is the equivalent of the user, I guess, for workloads, that could allow them to interact with the API server, meaning they can do anything they want. They can start pods, they can create pods, depending on the right that you give, they can make changes to the configuration. So now you have a workload that can actually control your entire cluster. So all of this advantage, again, of Kubernetes, if you want to take advantage of them, you have to be able to make sure that none of the workload is using any of these uh, many features that break uh, isolation. Same thing for, for integrity. Um, you know, sometimes it's just easier uh, to uh, make, make uh, a stateless uh, workload that's supposed to be, you know, uh, reboot it every time you make a change to make it stateful by sharing something, some, some of the host uh, file system, writing data so that when we restart, you can read the data. But that means that now the state of your, um, of your cluster uh, can change over time, right? Depending on whether uh, something was written to a file or not. Uh, it's also, there are also capabilities and privileges that allows a container to change uh, how the host is working, you know, make uh, kernel changes. Uh, so making changes outside of itself on the whole host. And again, that means now that you don't really have full control of, uh, of our, how your cluster look over time. And finally, with uh, replication. So I mentioned that you're not supposed to go into an application, into a container, and make any change to the uh, running application, but rather restart it. But you can do that. You can do a kubectl exec, which is the equivalent of SSH, doing SSH inside the container, make any change, um, and now you have a different version of the container than, than what you, you checked in. Uh, you can simply apply any configuration change in production. Uh, you can take any, any YAML file and apply it at any time. Uh, you don't have to go through your whole pipeline, checking code, CI, CD, and deploying it. Uh, and probably the most interesting thing is the um, mutating hook. So every time you make a change, you basically send um, an input to the API server with your configuration change. The API server uh, applies a change. Uh, but you can um, register webhooks to this uh, API server. And one of them, one, one of the type, is called a mutating webhook. And basically what it does is when you send your API input, it sends it to this mutating hook, which might change the definition of your uh, input, send it back to the API server, and now the API server applies a different version of your, uh, of your input. So you input something, and the API server, through the mutating hook, applies something else. So if this service, if this uh, webhook is not part of your application, but it's more like a, an external service that you manually installed, uh, then you don't have uh, the same um, state of your cluster that what has been checked in. So again, all of them exist for a good reason. Uh, there are good reasons to use it, uh, but if you don't have any, any, have any kind of process or understanding of what the setting are doing, uh, you, may, you may lose control of what's going on in your cluster. Something that you will also realize quickly if you look at the doc is that uh, Kubernetes is more than just orchestrating, layer, uh, orchestrating container. It's more than just creating, starting, and stopping pods. It's a brand new implementation of the network. Uh, it's about provisioning uh, vol volumes and or encrypted volumes and all kinds of volumes. It's, uh, it's about setting your ingress infrastructure. How do you expose services to uh, to the outside. It's about uh, managing users and service account. It's about managing secrets. And all of them are done in a different way from what you may be using today. Um, so if we take a look at a couple of examples of the net network abstraction. So now we don't have, with, with Kubernetes, you don't have uh, workloads that are 
bound to a specific IP or port. So any kind of network device, network visibility that uh, is based on IP addresses to map identity of different services won't work because when you, you'll have an IP used by workload A and then it will be workload B that use the same IP, uh, you won't be able to recognize who is doing what. Also, uh, because you have many workloads on the same nodes, most of the traffic is internal traffic. For a typical application, said that you no, know, about 70% of the traffic is internal and it might be internal to your host. So anything that's sitting on the network uh, won't, have won't see any of this traffic, obviously. And then if you add uh, service mesh that also encrypts traffic uh, when it leaves the, um, uh, the, the, the host, you won't, you won't be able to understand what it is traffic. Um, you won't be able, again, sitting on the network to make the difference between uh, traffic uh, coming from Kubernetes, from a workload inside the host, or traffic coming from the host itself. So if you're trying to reuse your IDS, your, your firewall, uh, you will miss a lot of things and you won't be able, you, you will lose all the, all the visibility. Uh, so that means that you need to use new solutions, new tools for networking. And it's not just for security, it's the same thing with operation, right? They cannot just do a TCP dump uh, on your host because uh, you, you're not going to, to be able to tell what is what. Uh, so you ha really have to spend time figuring out how do you get the same level of visibility for your network, for example, as you had before for your other type of application. Access authentication is the same thing. So the way um, role based authentication is done for uh, users and for uh, service account is different. Now, some companies have been able to adapt the existing uh, authentication that they have for regular users uh, to, um, to Kubernetes. A lot of them have been able to reuse OPA. So with a little bit of work, they've been able to have the same kind of processes to manage who has access to, um, to the cluster. Uh, but who has access is not enough. The, the way they all work are just very different from your typical Linux uh, groups or uh, default set of, uh, of roles. It's just very different. So you really have to go deep, just like you have to go deep on the network to understand really what you need to worry about and how you can adapt your current processes and user management to, to work with communities. And then you have to do the same, same thing with a service account that workloads may, may need. Uh, which is completely different from, uh, uh, from probably the way you manage users today. Secret is another huge area. Uh, so you have secrets for Kubernetes, now your certificates, private keys, your uh, encryption keys for your volumes. You have secrets for your applications. Uh, if you have a service mesh, it comes with another, another um, set of, uh, of secrets. So you have to make sure that you can manage your secrets safely, that you can uh, bootstrap everything safely. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not easy, and especially in earlier version of uh, Kubernetes, the way it was managing secrets was really um, horrible. Um, so a lot of uh, companies started with really bad practices around uh, managing uh, secrets, and you still see a lot of uh, workloads that just have secrets as environment variables, just visible to everybody in, uh, who has access to uh, to the cluster. So it's a large technology that covers a lot of things. Uh, it's also new, right? Community is just a couple of years old, so which means it still comes with a lot of vulnerability in the, um, in the software itself. Uh, there were RC being found. Uh, I think the, 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 the last audit didn't find any uh, big flow, but really a lot of lacks of hygiene uh, around security. And if you look at you know, the history of Kubernetes, there was a lack of security features uh, from the one in, in, in Kubernetes. It was really not the, um, uh, the primary focus, you know, having a secure platform, but really having an agile uh, platform. So I mentioned secrets, for example, that uh, uh, were uh, badly managed in, 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 uh, in, in Kubernetes at the beginning. There was also a lack of authorization and authentication uh, for a long time. A lot of the early attacks against Kubernetes that were seen in the press were because the uh, Kubernetes server, uh, API server, was exposed to the internet. Uh, it was kind of the, the default at the time. So you have to keep track of the availability of uh, Kubernetes, but also make sure that any of these uh, bad practices that maybe uh, came from the earlier version of, uh, 
of Kubernetes were not migrated as the company is moving from you know, one version to another. So make sure that you take advantage of all the new security features of uh, Kubernetes. And I mentioned that it's not only a change in uh, technology, it's also a change in how the organization has to work. The responsibilities are different now, right? The developers also have a big part in uh, setting up the infrastructure. It used to be that when developer needed new server, they had to go to the infrastructure team, you know, create tickets. Then the infrastructure team was working with the security infrastructure team, you know, a, long, a long process that took a long time, but also it came with a lot of checks uh, from different teams. Now the um, developers uh, with just one line of, of code can add a load balancer to their um, to that cluster. So who owns security for Kubernetes? Right? Especially since I mentioned that right now, as companies are deploying Kubernetes to production, their security team is often not involved. So one place could be DevOps, right? They're still in charge in making sure that the, uh, operation, that the cluster is up and running. Uh, but the security is typically not their primary concern. Again, they play a role, but their number one issue is making sure everything is running. And Kubernetes is a complicated piece of technology. Uh, it's very easy to make a mistake and uh, hard to debug again with the so many layers being different, the tool that they may be using for operation uh, may not work all the time. So they typically don't care. That's not the number one security. I mentioned that security Unfortunately, uh, it, it, they just don't, don't know. And the developer, uh, you know, we're already asking them to move from <laughs> application to now be the uh, infrastructure expert. You know, they want everything to work, right? If they, if they don't need to have a policy, a network policy, then that's, that's even easier for them. <laughs> so nothing against... No, anybody, right? Everybody should have a role, but nobody uh, cares about it. So what happened in reality? Not in your company, obviously. Is that nobody owns security. You know, maybe there's a CTO or a CISO that's telling everybody, hey, security is important, we have to do something, but there's nobody on the ground who actually owns it at their, at their main focus. And that's really been a, a, a big issue for many of our customers, you know, trying to figure out who does what. Uh, we had a customer, for example, that approached us to do network segmentation. They say, you know, we want to have a very strict network policy around uh, services. Only allow the strict minimum communication between each services. And six months later, I came to us and say, okay, we actually give up on network policy because we don't know who is supposed to own it. Is it the developers because they know how the application works? They know who is supposed to communicate with, with who? Yes, but again, that's setting, a, setting a, a network policy is just an obstacle for them, right? It just makes their job uh, harder. Should it be DevOps, because they are responsible of the infrastructure, we can include the, the network policy. Well, they don't necessarily know how the application works. How do they know that service A is supposed to talk to service B and not to service C? They probably don't have the knowledge. So network segmentation, there have been a lot of uh, talks about it, a lot of companies doing it, but in practice, uh, very few, um, very few companies doing you know full zero trust segmentation, and I'll explain what they actually do instead. Same thing with containers. You now, who defines if a container is allowed to run as root? Who defines if a container actually need to have all these capabilities? Uh, again, for developers, they want the application to run. Right? If it runs as root, it runs. Uh, that's not an issue. Uh, it's also very easy to make a mistake. Right? You have an issue with an application not running, you just get the YAML file from some you know, Stack Overflow or somewhere else, and it comes with all these privileges that there are made over 30 of them just for a, a container um, configuration, uh, over 30 different settings that have, some have not much influence on security, some are huge. Uh, so being able to know all of them and understand how they work together, it's very tricky. Uh, and so then could it, could it be the, de the DevOps? Uh, no, they are more used to know and to understand that running as root is not good and know how to separate privileges. But again, how do they know whether the application needs it or not? Right? You need to know what's, what it's supposed to do to be able to, to set a policy. 
And how, what is the, another very interesting thing is what is the process to export the service to the internet? Uh, that's actually been the number one issue that has happened to many customers is somebody, again, take a YAML file from some other place and they don't realize that in the many lines that define your container configuration, one line just uh, expose it as a load balancer. So with one line, you, be, you basically create the load balancer and expose your uh, service to the load balancer. And when you do that, there's no big red flashing light that says, hey, you're, going, you're, you're about to expose the service to the internet. Is it what you actually want to do, right? It just happens and nobody's a wiser. And a lot of time, the issue has not been caught in advance and it's been caught by accident, you know, days or weeks later, typically by, de by DevOps saying now, new kind of traffic, you know, new maybe uh, people scanning the internet and, and, and you know, unexpected traffic. Um, so it's a big issue to understand who owns what, what are the processes to avoid this kind of, uh, of issue. So the big question that everybody's trying to answer is how do you keep the agility of communities and uh, still are ab able to deploy application in a safe uh, manner? And again, it's not something that's brand new, but it's something that people have to do now. So instead of having gatekeepers, you know, whether it's a security team, whether it's the infrastructure team that just blocks everything until they have time to do their review, they are trying to set boundaries and basically tell the developers that within these boundaries, you can do anything. So if we take the example of network security, what a lot of companies now are doing is saying, hey, we are going to manage application by namespace or by um, by cluster, so basically group a bunch of workloads into a logical application and we the security team or we the DevOps team or we the, the, the compliance team are going to manage the ingress, so making sure that we only expose uh, services that are supposed to be ex uh, exposed and the egress, making sure that you only connect to known IPs, known domains and that everything is being encrypted. But within your boundaries, you can do anything. So if you don't want to set up a network policy, don't set up one. If you want to have some network policy, do it. We delegate the entire network policy, for example, um, in, uh, inside the, the, um, the boundary to the development team. But we'll take care of the, of the, of the perimeter of this uh, gallery. So that way they can still go fast, but they can go fast within, uh, within limits. Um, Teams are also trying to create their own compliance, own best practices. Uh, sometimes it's driven by external compliance framework, like yes, they need to be PCI, so they need to understand uh, what are these boundaries, but, some, but oftentimes is internal practices. For example, uh, they want to know, uh, DevOps team wants to know when there's an issue, who they need to contact, who is the team that developed this specific workload or application, because typically, there is one DevOps team, but there are many uh, development teams. Each of them manage different applications. So the use of label is very useful. Uh, in Kubernetes, you can attach labels to, uh, to workloads and uh, for operation, but also if it's something on with security, they can use a label to figure out, for example, a service owner label. And this use of label is, is also a good way to enable DevOps to be able to create policies without understanding the source code of the application. For example, if they have to be PCI compliant, they can start labeling which application have to be PCI compliant. And DevOps can then create a policy around it saying, okay, if your label, if your workload is labeled as uh, PCI compliant, then everything in the space has to be encrypted, for example. So now they don't need to understand how the application works, they just need to understand what the application needs based on the labels. And it can be the same, like which one are supposed to um, access PIS, which one are not. So now they can do segmentation between the two to make sure that PII never leave uh, the set of workload that are supposed to, to use it. Um, so that's a, that's a good way to get around this issue of not requiring DevOps to understand the application, uh, but let um, the developer explain what are the general needs uh, or general context of the, of the workloads. Uh, the shift left, again, not something new, something that uh, companies have been talking um, about uh, for a long time. That's actually made easier uh, with Kubernetes. So because everything is uh, checked in as, uh, as file, as YAML file, 
when you do a PR, when you change the security settings, for example, of your workloads, you can automatically uh, check whether it's complying with your policy and you can give feedback to, um, to the developer in, in real time. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. They are more than just configuration files. They are like scripts that can also change um, how your uh, workloads work. So obviously, you, you want to do that not just at the code repository level, but through your CI CD. But the idea is you're always checking whether something is going outside of the boundaries and giving feedback to, the, to developers as early as uh, possible. And now that companies are moving further you know, with Kubernetes and understanding uh, security a little bit better, they also understand what, uh, that what they were doing for a long time is not enough. So what company are, many companies are still doing right now is what I call securing the edge of Kubernetes. So they are looking at how the API server work. Uh, is it authenticated? Is it exposed to the internet? Again, it makes sense because many of the early compromises like Tesla, it was because of the API server being exposed to the internet. So they're, they're looking at the API server, make sure it's configured correctly. They are looking at the containers coming in into uh, Kubernetes um, doing image scanning. And a lot of companies stop there, right? Scanning, scanning Docker images, making sure the API server is okay. But they have no visibility inside Kubernetes. And when you know, a couple of these uh, breaches happened, uh, what happened for, again, what, what we, we could read in the press, so probably not all of them, but what happened is uh, people got access to the API server. They were able to um, add their own rock container uh, that run in the clusters, and thankfully for the people being breached, they were just Beacon Miner. Um, but think about what went wrong, right? First, um, they did not realize that somebody was accessing the API server. Then they were able to add a container, and there was no issue. The container was not using their image from their own repository, it was using some other random image, and again, that was not an issue. Then the container ran for, for days, for weeks. Um, looks like in one case it was a couple of months, and nobody saw anything. The container was connecting to the Bitcoin miner, right? Sending information, getting information. Uh, nothing was detected. And that's, that's because visibility uh, in Kubernetes, you know, at all layers, right? Network, who is supposed to have access to what, uh, is just very complicated and is not there out of the box, and you have to really look at a new tool and new processes to do that. So now they understand that they need to they need to have control over what's going on inside the cluster, and again at all layers, right? Understanding who has access to secrets, understanding um, what's the traffic coming going inside the application, any anomalies, what are the uh, egress traffic that I'm seeing, uh, what are the security settings of the different containers. So they need to have full visibility but also full control of, uh, of all of that. Um, and that's why it's a great time for startup because everybody is trying to uh, come up with the right solution uh, for that. Last slide. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, Kubernetes security, uh, the uh, CIS benchmark for Kubernetes is, uh, to my knowledge, the uh, only security best practices specific to, um, to uh, Kubernetes. Um, there is a new version that's going to come out very soon, uh, 1.5, that's a lot more extensive what, what, than what's today. It's a good start. It doesn't cover everything, but it covers a lot of areas. Uh, so that, that's a good place to look at. Uh, the CNCF uh, conferences, uh, every year there's one like in the US, Europe, Asia. Uh, they always have a couple of talks on security. Um, like this year, they had one, I think it was a class, but it's, it almost looks like a talk, where they were actually hacking um, a Kubernetes cluster, something more or less realistic, so you can, you know, good idea of what are the easy way right now to, uh, to hack into a cluster, you know, what, what attackers need to do, how ways to detect it, so that's a great, uh, great place to start. And at Octarine, we've released two open source projects that are looking specifically at the runtime configuration of the container. So I mentioned a couple of, uh, of uh, settings, if you remember, like share host network, share, share the IPC, share the pin namespace that breaks the isolation, but there are at least 30 of these settings 
uh, that have you know, small to very large uh, potential risk or remediation for security. And understanding what combination of risk make it a lot more risky uh, than others is uh, something that's not easy. So we've created a framework called the KCCSS. It probably rings a bell, right? It's based on the CVSS. So that's a Kubernetes Common Configuration Scoring System. And the idea is we, we took um, a standard way of rating security. So showing what is the impact of the specific setting on availability, um, integrity, confidentiality, how likely is it to be exploited? Is it, uh, does it require local access or remote access? So we've done that for all of these 30 settings. And we have created a, a formula to take then all of these risks individually and get the same risk score from 0 to 10 for the entire workload. So you can easily um, know which of your workloads are the most risky and then go get into the details and understand, OK, I'm, I have a public, I have a, a workload that's privileged, that has a service token uh, uh, attached to it, which can which allows them to create pods. And this is, it is also directly open to the internet for load balancers. So you can really understand how these risks work together and prioritize what you want to, to fix. And KubeScan is basically an open source implementation of KCCSS. So KCCSS is basically a bunch of roles, YAML file. And KubeScan takes these roles, uh, comes as a container that you run on your, um, on your cluster and give you a nice web UI with a list of uh, workload risk and all the details. So to summarize, uh, Kubernetes is great. It does come with a lot of advantage for security. Uh, but you have to make sure that you actually enforce uh, these uh, settings. Otherwise, you may not get any of these uh, advantage. It's very wide. It's not just about controlling containers. It's a brand new network stack, secret management, and everything. So you really have to go deep, unfortunately, in all of this area, especially to understand what's the default configuration, what's the right way to manage all of that, and figure out how you can get the same level of visibility that you used to have, the same level of control, what tools you need uh, to be able to bring all of this information and control back to your regular security incidents response and reporting that you do for, for your other uh, application. So it's a lot of work. Uh, it, is, it is interesting. You probably don't have a choice because your company is, you know, at the very least, looking at Kubernetes and probably using it for Maybe not the main application yet, but for, for many applications. I mean, we've seen banks adopting Kubernetes at a fast pace. So if banks are adopting it, uh, your company is probably using it already. How about governments? Well, so uh, there was an interesting talk um, uh, from uh, somebody from, um, from the DoD uh, explaining that they're running Kubernetes on uh, F16. They're running on the Kubernetes on the plane, everywhere. Yeah, so it is everywhere. <laughs> uh, thanks. I just want to, sorry, before the question, uh, first slide, I should have mentioned my email address. It's Julian with an E, not an A, at OctarinSec, and I'll leave a couple of um, Business card if you want to get in contact to me and cannot find me uh, at the keynote or at the event today or tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. Uh, how does the uh, how does the the representation of Kubernetes or the or the deployment of Kubernetes in the various cloud providers affect security? Does it have any effects? So yeah, is that's EKS a great... better than GCP. Is there any security impact to where you're deploying your Kubernetes? Yeah, that's a very good question. So very few people are. I using the vanilla version of Kubernetes. Uh, each version, uh, each cloud has its own version, which differs mostly in the default configuration and also in the list of uh, options. So, as an example, there might be in Kubernetes like five times the volume you can you can create, but maybe JKE Google has a, has three of them, and maybe another one's four. Um, so. It, it's uh, so that's one aspect, you know, the default configuration and what you have access to, uh, which is true for different cloud, but also for uh, managed version of communities that you install on premise, like uh, uh, OpenShift. 
Um, so the headache for us as a vendor is mostly to make sure that when you install the application, it works uh, in the way, it, it works with the limitation of the different uh, vendors. Uh, probably the biggest uh, change is uh, some of the uh, Kubernetes offering um, abstract completely the, the, the servers. So a lot of offering right now, you still create nodes and that's how you pay actually, right? Typically the uh, uh, control plane, uh, sorry, the, 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 the managed server is free and then you just create uh, EC2 instances and then you have, um, you have their version of a, a Kubernetes running on it. Uh, but some of them are completely uh, abstracting the, uh, the host. And a lot of security solutions, for example, work by having one container with privileged access so they can actually escape the container and manage all of the, all of the containers on the host from the, from the container itself. Uh, and that's not always possible when you don't have access to the host at all. You mentioned the challenges of um, bootstrapping uh, secrets and I wondered if you had any suggestions because it is something that we're facing right now about how to best bootstrap those secrets into a cluster. Yeah, so a lot of uh, companies have decided to just move the secrets out of Kubernetes altogether and using uh, uh, an external vault, uh, whether it's something like HashiCorp or some of the uh, secret management that comes with the cloud. Um, and they typically have uh, an easier way to, um, to uh, manage secret and bootstrap. I mean, that's the whole business, right? Um, but the... the Controlling the, controlling the access to, to, to the vault is uh, seems, uh, still something quite hard. And also, how do you get the same redundancy of your, of your vault uh, when you're talking about now some, some people are running hundreds, thousands of, uh, of servers uh, with containers on it and or a, single, um, a single vault because doing redundancy for vaults uh, can be tricky as well. So they've, got, they've gone this way, so it's a different set of issues. Uh, but it's still some issues. Um, but many of them are, are trying to avoid storing secrets in, in Kubernetes. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. If you have any more later on, write me down.